Bum, 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 bum. Hello, everybody. Dennis Prager here. The Ultimate Issues Hour is the third hour every Tuesday, unless unless it's a national or congressional election. It's a presidential election, national election, or if it's the day after the State of the Union address. In other words, basically every Tuesday. But I, I'm I'm so a little I'm a little obsessive on I think I'm OCD on accuracy. Uh, I, so uh, I'm ribbed a lot uh, by friends about that. Anyway, we're we're on just about every Tuesday, third hour, and it is the ultimate issues hour because those are the those are the issues that ultimately are ultimate. And if the ultimate is not clear, then the penultimate is not clear. Is that clear? <laughs> to some, to some that was clear. To others, it was not. My point is that ultimate issues are critical, and we don't talk about them enough. So I have an ultimate issues hour, the great questions of life. Well, as you know, the great project of my life, explaining the Bible, at least the first five books, the foundational texts of the Bible for Jews and Christians, and for even just people who are Bible-centered who may not have been a Jew or a Christian in a theological sense, like Benjamin Franklin. This is the seminal text of, of, of history, the most powerful, most uh, most. Uh, influential book in history, and people don't know why. Even a lot of people who know something about it, who can answer the question, gee, who were Cain and Abel? Even they cannot answer, cannot explain its significance. So that's what I intended to do. The publication of the Rational Bible. If you have any curiosity about life, I'll tell you, a a guy, a 22-year-old wrote to me, said he was 20% of the way through the book, and if he stopped now, this was really powerful, if he stopped reading it now, he would still say it changed his life. I've never said that about a book of mine, and I think they're important. All of them are important, and I would would not have written them, but this one is meant to be a life changer. Explaining the book of Exodus. Next, Next year will be Genesis. So... I, what I what I want to do is explain the Bible on the Ultimate Issues Hour. Not every Ultimate Issues Hour will be devoted to that, but a lot of them will, because this is the ultimate issue. These are the ultimate issues. God, meaning, suffering, existence. What is it all about? Where do we go? How do we live? Why is God important? Today I'm going to talk to you about something I've never I've never discussed with you. It's of surpassing importance. Why is the God of the Bible, the God of Genesis and Exodus, let's even just isolate it to that, why is it the most important idea in world history? And this is, I'm reading to you from page 93 in my 500-page book. Of, uh, of Exodus. Number one, the God introduced by the Bible is the first God in history to have been entirely above and beyond nature. And one of the first things God tells humans is to exercise dominion over nature. This liberated humanity from believing it was controlled by nature, a revolution that made moral and scientific po- progress possible. So listen to that. Now, this is fascinating, if I may say so. I mean, I'm reading it like somebody else wrote this, so it sounds a little funny telling you it's fascinating, but it it is fascinating. So, you know, people are very annoyed today. A lot of folks who are annoyed with the Bible and with Judaism and Christianity. Oh, you know, this was a terrible thing to have people have dominion. So, by the way, a lot of people have retranslated it, which is the ultimate dishonesty. When they, when they translate texts in order to fit their agenda. I mean, if you don't like the text, fine. I respect that. You don't like the text, but you can't translate it differently than it actually appears. 
So we're told that we're to be caretakers. No, no. The Hebrew, I happen to know the biblical Hebrew, or to be very precise, pre-prophets biblical Hebrew, because the prophets speak in a somewhat different Hebrew. But the uh, the early Hebrew of the, of the Bible, I know it extremely well. And the word is dominion, control, dominate. The Hebrew word for dictator comes from the same root. Yes, we're supposed to have control over nature. You know why? Because otherwise nature controls us. And that's not, uh, that's not a good idea. Also, again, we're talking about why God is most important. The God of this Bible is the most important idea in history. It told men to control nature, not allow nature to control them. That is why you and I are the beneficiaries of science. Because science, or medicine specifically, is all about controlling nature. We won't let that cell metastasize. We're going to control nature. We're going to get rid of the Anopheles mosquito. That's controlling nature, dominating nature. It's a, it's a war, nature versus us. That doesn't mean there aren't beautiful things in nature. Of course there are. But it's, that's a separate issue entirely. I read now, a second consequence of God being above nature is humans are not part of nature. Meaning that just as we are to control the natural world outside us, we are to control our own human nature within us as well. We are to govern ourselves by moral law, not by human nature. All right, this is just reason number one. How many reasons do I give here? Let me see. Oh, my God, I give 12. No, yeah, 12. No, I give 14. 15. Oh, my God. 15 reasons why the God of the Bible is the most important idea in history. Number one, God is above nature. Number two, so it tells us we can control nature. Number two. The God introduced by the Bible brought universal morality into the world. Only if a moral God is universal is morality universal. Morality was no longer local or individual. Cultures do not need to be universal. The world is enriched by multiple cultures, but morality must be universal. All right, get that? That's reason number two. It's the most important idea in history. It means that... There is good and evil that transcends national and cultural boundaries. Murder is wrong for every culture on earth. Stealing is wrong for every culture on earth. And incidentally, I make the point elsewhere, as I have on this program, that stealing is the epidemic that is singly uniquely responsible for the backwardness of many countries because they can't get out of their corruption. You cannot advance with a fully corrupt or a very corrupt country. All right, so number two was the universal God means a universal morality. Number three, the moral God introduced by the Bible means morality is real. Good and evil are not merely individual or societal opinions. They are objectively real. This was also new. You did not have the notion of good and evil being objectively real. They were simply what any given society or gods preferred. That's all. To the extent that they even preoccupied themselves with good and evil, which was not universal preoccupation. All right, I'm going to come to number four when we come back. I'm discussing why God is the most important idea in history. The, the, the absolute, you could date the world before God, after God, B.G. and A.G. I don't mean this theologically. I mean it logically. I'm not asking you to become a member of my or any other religion. I'm just asking you to understand the overwhelming consequences of the most important idea in history. It's in the Rational Bible. You are listening to The Dennis Prager Show.
Hi, everybody. I'm actually reading from this, the Rational Bible. Just came out. On the Ultimate Issues Hour, I have spent a lot of my life, obviously, as you well know, arguing for their Christian values and for the preeminence of the Bible and for God-based morality, the Ten Commandments, and so on. I have not spent a lot of my time arguing for God's existence. Uh, to me, if it, if the you, set of spectacularly unlikely things that had to happen and exist does not convince you that there is probably a creator, then uh, there is really pretty much nothing I will say that will do it. So what I have spent most of my life talking about is the importance of God. Because on the other hand, if God exists but is not significant, then that doesn't matter either. So I'm reading to you from one of the many essays in my commentary, The Rational Bible, why it's the most God is the most important idea in human history. Number one was that... Nature doesn't control us because God made nature, and we are to control nature. That made possible the entire pursuit of health, of medicine. Number two, universal morality. Number three, that morality, moral God, means that good and evil are real. They are not just opinions. I'll take some calls and continue here. Mike in Frisco, Texas. Hi, Mike. Dennis Prager. Hi, Dennis. Um, you had said that, that you know God, the existence of God lends to a universal morality that is independent of culture. That there, you know, we can have many cultures that enrich us, but uh, but there's a universal morality. So, what happens when morality and culture intersect? As in the case of you know, in some. We know that in some African tribes, and you know, I think there's even some cities in the United States where it's fine if a woman wants to go around topless. Where you have we have the moral principle that you know men and women should be modest, but culture determining what modesty is in that particular localized area. It's a superb question, which is why I took it. I actually I remember when I was in my. Uh, the late teens, I was sitting next to a guy in synagogue who uh, was a, becoming a rabbi, and he did his thesis on exactly that issue, the relativity of modesty. Because in Judaism, there are very specific laws governing a covering up of uh, one's body, how much is necessary, and so on. And he concluded that it was overwhelmingly relative which, by the way, I don't have a problem with. I've explained uh, uh, on other occasions that situations always determine ethics, but ethics, but morality is still absolute. But I, I, won't, I, won't, I won't bother with that now. It's too, it's too long for this moment. But he, n- any of us who would even argue that, that some element of modesty is a universal desire after all, the first thing God does when Adam and Eve know that they're naked is give them clothing, right? Well, they actually gave themselves clothing first. Well, no, no, not true. He made it for them. If you read the text, it's fascinating. He made it. He he made the clothing. But it doesn't matter. He, he whether, whether you think he did or it, it does matter, actually. God, well, give, God well, gave it to they them. They clothed themselves with leaves first, correct? Yes, right. But God made, but God made them clothing to wear. God was part of the process of, of their covering up. So it's obvious that God wants them wants us to be covered up. So the question you're asking is how much? And to a very large extent, it's relative. I mean, the, uh, the Muslim fundamentalist would argue that it, a, a woman should cover everything, including her eyes, or everything except her eyes, or everything except her face. And uh, Orthodox Jewish women will argue, no, that's not necessary, but you have to wear a long skirt, and you can't. Uh, you have to wear a sleeves. You can't wear sleeveless. These things do, in fact, become, by definition, relative. What is not relative is the concept of modesty, 
what is relative is how much. Does that make sense? It, it does. It just winds up being a little unsatisfying when you're when when you wind up hearing about you know say a girl in school who you know bears her midriff and she's like why do I have to cover up you know well, no, uh, yeah right right and like, we we ha- we have established that that amount of of bare skin violates our our rules of modesty that is correct I admit it she has gone beyond the culture's norm by doing that. It, it, and uh, it it has a, a you know a, a clearly erotic response in the vast majority of men. Now you may argue that you know anything a woman shows has a clearly erotic response, and there's some truth to that too. So there's no perfect answer to your question. I I have grappled with it. There is no perfect answer. I think that uh, ironically, I think America in the in the fifties, forties, thirties really did come up with a really good answer. There. They're, there was, there were guidelines clearly that w- could not be violated, but women still wore clothing that was even sexy, N- not gross, not not semi naked, but you know, but but made it clear that I'm a woman, and uh, it worked out. We we went to the other extreme though. We went now. Nothing, you know, nothing is to be hidden. All right, let me continue with why God's the most important idea in history. Number four, the God introduced by the Bible morally judges every human being. There had never been a concept like this, and it became a, a major reason for Jew hatred. People do not like to be judged. And the people who introduced the idea of God who morally judges people have paid a terrible price for bringing the idea into the world. The social psychologist Ernest von den Haag wrote, fundamental to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> fundamental to anti-Semitism, though seldom explicit and conscious, is hostility to the Jewish belief in one God, the Jews' invisible God, not only insisted on being the one and only and all-powerful God, creator and lord of everything and the only rightful claimant to worship, he also developed into a moral God. No wonder the Jews are the target of all those who resent his domination. So that is the next... That is the next major reason for the importance of the unique importance of the God of the Bible, a moral judge of humanity. That's a big deal. Certainly Zeus didn't do it. Osiris didn't do it. 1-8 Prager 776, the ultimate issues hour on the Dennis Prager Show. All right, everybody. Welcome to or welcome back to the Dennis Prager Show, the ultimate issues hour, third hour every Tuesday. I hope I get through all 15 reasons. It's all in there in the the book, The Rational Bible, which just came out. And my dream is, and uh, we are on our way there to being the uh, best-selling Bible commentary in America. And I hope that that takes place. And you're a big part of the reason if it does. It's my life's work. All right. Number five. Why about why God is the most important idea in history. Number five. The just and good God introduced by the Bible gives humanity hope. One of those hopes is ultimate justice. The belief that God judges humans means that both the good and the evil will get what they ultimately deserve. Even though justice is rarely served served in this world, there is a good God who will ultimately set things right. I mean, there are so many hopes. I mean, obviously, if there is a God, there is a hope that we will see our loved ones. uh, uh, And we don't all go into oblivion. I mean, I could just spend, maybe I will, maybe I'll just talk... One of these ultimate issues hours about just the this element that the God of the Bible introduced hope 
into mankind. Now, let's go on to number six. The God introduced by the Bible introduced holiness. The elevation of human beings from animals to creatures created in God's image. I mean, the, it's astonishing to think that all of these things were, were brand new introductions. But they are. It's one of the reasons I believe in this book and in God. It's so, it's, God is as different from everything, the Bible is as different from everything that preceded it as life is from non-life. There are people who think life came from non-life naturally, even though we don't have a shred of evidence as to how you go from non-life to life, from the inorganic to the organic. So too, and th- and that's one of the reasons I believe in, in God's creating, because you don't go from life to non-life, or you don't go for, and you don't go from nothing to something without something outside of it making it. So, too, uh, the same thing here. The Bible is to pre-biblical life what life is to non-life. And it has no explanation that is not divine. Number seven. The, The God introduced by the Bible gives Every individual unprecedented self-worth, since all humans are created in God's image, each of us is infinitely valuable. Every person has the right to say, as the Talmud put it, for my sake was the world created. All right, I got through seven. We have a chance. I think I may do 15 and take calls. 1-8 Prager 776. Time for blink. That is correct. So we have a uh, a very wonderful product here. I've used it and it's 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 quite remarkable. Let's go to blinkprotect.com slash dennis. Blinkprotect.com slash dennis. And it is these cam cameras that you put up, they've a great they're a great price to begin with, and you get an extra ten percent off if you do the slash dennis. Not if you slash me, if you do the slash dennis. I want to make that clear. And if you, you see what's happening on your smartphone, you could, you will get monitored. You will see what's happening on your porch, for example. It's uh, You really prevent uh, burglaries this way. Anyway. Hello, everybody. Dennis Prager here. The Ultimate Issues Hour, third hour every Tuesday on my show. Giving you 15 reasons why the most important idea in history is the God introduced by the Bible. And it's all in the rational Bible, which, needless to say, I hope you get. Not for the obvious reasons that every author would like people to get their book. Although, I mean, obviously there's an element of that. But this is the project of my life, and it is because I think it's the most important thing to reintroduce the Bible as the central text of American life and Western civilization's life, for that matter. All right, number eight, why God is the most important idea in history. The God introduced by the Bible is necessary for human brotherhood. Since we all have the same father, we are all brothers and sisters. As the prophet Malachi asked, have we not all one father? Did not one God create us? Malachi, or Malachi, is a one of the Hebrew prophets. That was 2.10. Number nine, the God introduced by the Bible began the long journey to belief in human equality solely as a result of the statement in the Bible in Genesis that each of us is created in God's image. Slavery was abolished on a wide scale, first in the Western world, by Christians who were rooted in the Torah, that's the first five books, and the rest of the Hebrew Bible, and who specifically cited the Torah doctrine that all humans are created in God's image. Number 10, the God introduced by the Torah is incorporeal. No body, no no physicality. This opened the human mind to abstract thought by enabling humans to think in terms of a reality beyond that which is accessible to our senses. 
Number 11, the God introduced by the Bible teaches us the physical is not the only reality. Consequently, there can be non-physical realities, such as a soul, an afterlife, and morality. All righty, good. Let's go uh, to uh, Tony in Mountain Home, Arkansas. Hi, Tony. Dennis Prager. Hi, Dennis. Hey, I just had a question, and I don't mean to put you on the spot or anything You can. Like that. By the way, ne- never f- I, never hesitate putting me on the spot. It's fine. Oh, okay, Dennis. Well, I want you to just know I respect you very much. I do. I do. Thank uh, you. Uh, I just want to know, do you believe, and I think my question was already answered by the previous caller, but I'll ask it anyway. Do you believe in the concept of God or in a literal God himself? Literal God. Okay, but I well, am that explaining. My question. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, well, that's right, and I do very much. But I, I, I want the the non-believer to be able to understand why it is that someone would believe. So that's that's part of the reason that I've written this this part: the fifteen reasons why God is the most important concept. See, we're not going to get people to take God seriously if we just make arguments for God's existence. We have to show why it's not God doesn't only exist, but why God is important. Very good. So, well, so I as a res- received instruction from a very wise man. <laughs> well, that's very kind of you to say that. But uh, I totally understand your question. Because I emphasize the importance, people can sometimes wonder, well, does he believe in the importance of God or really in God? And the answer is both. Okay? Okay. Very good. Uh, All right. Thank you so much. You're a good man. Clearly a good man. But you you have a, I mean, I'll, I'll sharpen your question. Your question should really be, why did God intervene in the exodus and not in the holocaust that's a that's a more logical uh, framework to put it in and in the final analysis i i don't claim to be able to answer every question with regard to why god does x or y my own my answer is free will which god 99 percent of the time allows people to engage in and the other answer is a famous medieval Hebrew phrase, Lu yadati vayitiv. I'm saying it only in Hebrew because you can hear the rhyme. If I knew him, I'd be him. I fully acknowledge. I have questions. I even have uh, anger. I have anger at God over things. I just, but it's okay to be angry with God. The name of Israel means struggle with God. What you can't do is ignore him. You're listening to The Dennis Prager Show. Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager here. I'm, I'm torn. Do I give you the rest of the 15 or do I take calls? <laughs> I'm really torn. All right. Well, Sean called it for you, folks. I'll, I'll try to do both. I'll go very fast here. I'm now up to 12. The, why God is the most important concept in history in my on page 93, 4, 94, 95, 96 in my the Rational Bible. The God introduced by the Bible means there is ultimate meaning to existence and to each of our lives. Without this creator, existence is random and purposeless. I have, a, I have an atheist philosopher quoted here who agrees. Number 13, the God introduced by the Bible gives human beings free will. If we are only material beings, like the stellar dust of which we are composed, everything we do is determined by genes and environment. Only if we have a non-material soul can we rise above our genes and our environment environment, and act autonomously. Number 14, the God introduced by the Bible teaches might is not right. It is God who determines what is right, not displays of strength or force. And 15, The God introduced by the Bible made human moral progress possible. In fact, it invented moral progress. 
Why is a complex thing, but it I, I have it and it's developed there. Okay, cool. And let's see here. Let me let me at least summarize some of the calls. Okay, so Jack in San Antonio is a true Jews don't believe in heaven or hell or an afterlife. Many Jews do not believe in an afterlife, Jack, but uh, Judaism does. Jews and Judaism should not be confused. Many Jews do not believe in Judaism or do not believe in traditional Jewish beliefs. The Encyclopedia Judaica, which is a secular work of Jewish scholarship, has the first line under afterlife. Judaism has always affirmed a belief in the afterlife. Mike in Columbus says, the book I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist helped him a lot. Good. I love to hear about good books. And let's see. Uh, Nicholas quotes Voltaire saying, it's not important whether God exists or not. Society needs him. Well, it's important whether God exists, but yes, society needs him. All right, I can't take everybody, Mike, Chris, and so on. Forgive me on all of that. My friends, I promise the book will change your life. It's meant to. It's called The Rational Bible. Thank you for listening, and I will see you tomorrow speaking at Columbia University tomorrow evening. That should be interesting. I'm Dennis Prager. Take care. Hi, everybody. You are listening to The Dennis Prager Show. Great to be with you. This is the hour every week, the third hour of my show on Tuesdays is devoted to some great issues. I feel vindicated. It was a risk, actually, and I mean it. It was a risk on talk radio, daily shows. People don't tend to do this. To talk regularly, that means every single week at a set time, certainly, or even not set times, on the the great larger issues of life. People are, con- people, it is thought that people tune into uh, these shows to talk radio to hear just news and analysis, and I understand that view, and a lot of people do it, and I certainly do it. I both listen and I broadcast on those matters. But I feel vindicated that Americans understand that there are a lot of bigger issues that they want to have some answers to as well. There's no other explanation for the fact, to, to my unbelievable happy surprise, that my book published yesterday, The Rational Bible, is the second best selling book in the United States of America. Not the second best selling religious book, book. It's behind a book by the way, on gay bunnies. So uh, there's there's something uh, interesting about that. Uh, I have to believe that there's a built-in audience for gay bunny books that may not exist for mine <laughs> because other, it's, it's hard to understand otherwise why, but I have no complaints. I, I'm, I'm beyond delighted. Why do I say I'm vindicated? It means that people are thirsting for, for actual answers to big questions. They're not going to get it in the Gay Bunnies book, but uh, they will get it in the Bible. And the problem is that people have not taught the Bible, just as people have not taught America well. L- let me say something in this regard that's really important, and it'll help you understand my whole life and what this is all about, the show and everything that I do here and why many of you resonate or at least tune in. What has happened, I realized, is that the greatest ideas have lost their advocates. People have, people don't know how to make the case for America. Listen, the generation that many Americans call the greatest generation, I don't believe they were the greatest. I think they were great. There were a number of great generations, but it doesn't matter. The greatest generation, the World War II generation, gave birth to the most narcissistic generation in American history, my generation, the baby boomers. Okay? Why? For many reasons, not least of which, or perhaps most important of which is, they didn't teach their children to appreciate America. And so their children didn't. And their grandchildren have contempt for America. And so on and so forth. And now being American, being a white American, 
are just negatives. They're, they're purely negative. It's gone from not all positive to all negative. What has happened? People didn't know how to pass on the values. That's what's exactly what has happened in religious life. People have in possession of this great book, the Bible, but they don't know how to pass on its values. So I've, I, in my life, I've taken on the task of passing on both American values and biblical values. That's, my, that's what I sort of assigned myself the task of doing with my life. So now you'll understand why it's so important to get these things clear, because otherwise we lose these magnificent things like the Judeo-Christian value system and the American value system, which is predicated on it. So I wrote a column today that I'd like to talk to you about. It's, you could see it at Town Hall. You could see it at National Review and many other places. In fact, a uh, a... Uh, a conservative writer, the deputy managing editor of National View, wrote a response to my column immediately, a secular conservative response to Dennis Prager. I, I wrote a piece uh, which appeared, as I said, in National Review as well as the Town Hall and, and other places, and it's on my, on my own website, my weekly column, and it's it titled Conservatives Too." Undergo sexual, se- secular, sexual, that's, that was Freudian. Conservatives, too, undergo secular indoctrination. That's the title of the book. So uh, I tell the story. Many years ago, I attended a dinner at a wealthy man's New York City condo with, among others, one of the most prominent and influential conservatives in American life. I wish I could tell you who it was, but I don't think it would be fair to him. Uh, to, to do so. I admired this man then, and I admire him now. He has since passed on. He was a major force for good in America. At one point, the subjects of God and religion came up, and I mentioned how essential God is to morality, that without God, morality is subjective, a matter of personal or communal opinion. Having debated atheist scholars, all of whom agreed with this not very audacious observation, I was quite surprised when this prominent conservative took strong issue with me. God is morally unnecessary, he stated with some passion. Why would any educated person think otherwise? This was my first confrontation, I was a young man at the time, with the unsettling realization that to be a conservative did not necessarily mean being religious. Until that time, I had naively assumed that it did. I thought so for three reasons. First, all the religious, God-based, Bible-based, religiously active people I knew or studied were conservative. And I grew up in an Orthodox Jew in the yeshiva world, home to some liberals, many conservatives, and no leftists. Second, in American terms, the American conservative I most admired, William F. Buckley Jr., the founder and publisher of National Review, was a deeply religious Catholic. Third, America was founded on religious, specifically Judeo-Christian principles. Wouldn't a conservative seek to conserve all of America's basic principles? It's a testament to the power of our secular education, primary school through university, that it has successfully secularized students from conservative homes almost as well as students from liberal and left-wing homes. Most well-educated conservatives have embraced secular values and made peace with a secular and godless America just as much as have well-educated leftists. One has to wonder what secular conservatives do with statements such as the famous one of John Adams. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And what do they do when they read George Washington's farewell address, in which he said, Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. I think the answer is they do what liberal and left-wing secularists do, either ignore these statements or regard them as a quaint aspect of the founder's thinking. Here are some questions for secular conservatives. Do you think America will be able to prosper or even survive 
as the nation you love if the American people abandon God and religion? Two, do you think the West will be able to do so? Three, what do you believe will give future generations of Americans meaning in the way religion has until now? Four, with regard to God and religion, how do you differ from left-wing secularists? And five, what book or books do you believe ought to replace the Bible as providers of wisdom to the American people? And I end by writing, Yesterday my book, The Rational Bible, a 500-page commentary on the book of Exodus, was published. It is probably the biggest surprise of my life that as of this writing, it ranks number two on Amazon. Not number two among religious books, number two among all books sold in America. If there was one book I have written that I never entertained hopes of becoming a bestseller, this was it. I think the primary explanation is a yearning among many Americans for meaning and wisdom neither of which their godless upbringing and education provided, even if it was conservative. So that's my challenge to the libertarians and the conservatives who don't think America needs religion. What are your answers to my challenges to you? Can America survive without it? 1-8 Prager 776, the ultimate issues hour on the Dennis Prager Show. Hello everybody, Dennis Prager here. Dennis Prager here, the ultimate issues hour. And I wrote a challenge to conservatives today on my in my syndicated column that comes out Tuesdays. There's already been an intelligent uh, response to it by a writer at National Review who grew up Catholic and is now agnostic and says, you know, I don't know exactly, though, how he, he didn't really answer me. I mean, it was a, it was a thoughtful answer, but it did, didn't answer my challenge. How is America going to survive without what the founders thought was the bedrock of the country, and that is religion and God and the Bible. That's what they thought. So you can say they were wrong, they were quaint, they were people of their times. Fine, okay, you could say all that. What are we supposed to substitute it with? It's it's not enough to, to fight the good fight, and it is a good fight, for limited government, which is huge. Huge, absolutely huge. There's liberty is directly affected by affected in a bad way by the size of government government grows liberty declines it's simple as that but it's not enough if the government gets smaller then people need to get their values from something other than government and you know my life i realize in all of the arguments for God and religion, I I have much more argued for the necessity of God and religion than for the existence of God and religion. I've always said that. I said, my I want people, when people understand that we can't live without a transcendent being and a transcendent source of our meaning and transcendent source of ethics, then they will, then they can grapple all they want with, well, does God really exist? What religion is true? I don't, you can grapple with that all day long. The most important thing I have always felt, and I feel vindicated of my lifetime's work in this regard, is to teach people the necessity. See, that, we can't agree on the existence, but we can agree on the necessity of God and God-based ethics and so on. My, I am very mind-driven in my life. If I believe I need a car, then I will learn how to drive a car. If, if my life were not possible without an automobile or would be just horrifically affected without one, then even if I were scared of driving, I would learn how to drive. 
My argument to people is if you understand the importance of God and religion or good religion, because I always have to make that point, I'm not advocate. I'm not an advocate of any God and I'm not an advocate of any religion. I'm an advocate of good religion based on a good God, right? Which is the point of my of my religious outlook and spelled out in uh, in my book, The Rational Bible. But if if you become aware of the importance, then why wouldn't you start living it? See, here, it's an interesting issue that I'm going to have to raise on another another uh, Ultimate Issues hour. We so identify religion with faith that, in fact, the word religion and the word faith are synonymous in American English or in English generally. And that is good and not good. The not good part is that people think, oh, if I don't have the faith, then there's no reason for me to have the religion. I don't believe that. I think that if it can make sense, and you realize how morally significant and life-filling it is, you do it anyway. It's like people in arranged marriages who learn to love each other. Think everybody in arranged marriage doesn't love each other? A lot of people ended up with very loving marriages in, from an arranged marriage. Because they knew this is the person I'm with. I better I better figure out how to love this person. And a lot of times it works. That's why I'm telling you as I did in this article, whether you are an agnostic or even an atheist should be irrelevant to whether or not you, for example, raise your kids with a religious education. It's like tone-deaf parents, parents who couldn't st- can't stand Beethoven, should give their kids classical piano lessons. Because you know it's worthwhile even if you yourself don't relate to Beethoven. People don't understand the significance. They they go with what they believe. But I'm I, I I I'm not interested in what people believe. I'm interested in what people advocate and how people behave. Then, if you start studying, and you start living, and you get a community, you may very well end up quote unquote religious. The human being is shaped by his or her own behavior. Behave loving, you'll feel loving. Behave happy, you'll feel happy, right? That's my whole point about the happiness hour. Well, behave religious, you might end up feeling religious. That's where my uh, conservative friends who are secular make a mistake. They don't understand the need for this to continue and even if you are personally in the realm of uh, of agnosticism. How are we doing there, Sean? Am- okay, so we'll be back in a moment. 1-8-Prager-776. We'll take your calls. I'm Dennis Prager. There's an article apropos of what you just heard about the offer at Prager, the Prager store. There's an article up at DennisPrager.com. It was printed in uh, FrontPageMag.com, uh, let's see, eight years ago. Yep, eight years ago, March 2010, by a wonderful man, Matthew Duda. Eighteen years, five books, one Torah, and Dennis Prager. The talk radio host Torah studies help a Catholic deepen his faith. And it's based on exactly those 18 years of talks that are now available at half price. This only happens once or twice a year. And they, uh, you should read how they affected this man. And it's up at DennisPrager.com, that article by Matthew Duda, a Catholic who took my courses almost all, almost all 18 years. And you can get that at half price, plus get a free copy of... 
the Rational Bible signed by me. It's, a, it's only this week. And there's also a, uh, what is it, a banner at TennisPrager.com. And the book, uh, by the way, does remain uh, the second best-selling book in the United States. I uh, Think about it, folks. A Bible commentary, the second best-selling book in the United States. The first best-selling book is, uh, is about uh, gay uh, bunnies. There, are t- there really are two Americas. It's just the way it is. We have to be grown-ups and recognize it. Okay. All right. I am talking to you about the the phenomenon of many secular conservatives and they, they not realizing with all their conservatism and and I thank them and uh, they're my friends and they're my colleagues but they don't uh, realize that uh, a secular future is not America is not in America or the west interest. As I've been saying on TV shows uh, yesterday and today, doing publicity for the Rational Bible, this is the biggest experiment in American, and excuse me, in world history. This is the most radical experiment. This is the first, the last two generations of the first godless generations in human history. So if you're happy with the results, you think people are happier and more rooted and more decent and more sense of purpose, then there's nothing to worry about. And if you don't think that, then there is something to worry about. That's right. Thank you for doing so. It's uh, an amazing thing that uh, it's the second best-selling book in America. I've uh, I feel wonderful about it, and I think you know me. It's uh, it's not a big ego issue. I have my ego in check. It's my uh, I didn't write a Bible commentary for ego reasons. I'm thrilled beyond words that. Uh, good number of Americans will be reading an intelligent, rational explanation of what the Bible's about. And it will change their lives. I I already see on some of the reviews, they just pick up one point and go, wow. Somebody told my wife, uh, he was reading it in a restaurant, and he texted her that when he heard, when he read the the line that it's, uh, it's actually liberating to fear God because then you don't fear people. And he said, wow, God, is that liberating? That's right, it is. The Rational Bible. Incidentally, I'm told, if this matters to you, uh, that uh, if you buy five copies, they don't include it as five purchases. You have to buy it five times. (laughs) So I'm telling you, if you want to make it number one, I'm only telling you for that. I'm very happy for you to get five at once, but I, I I didn't want to share that news that I just got from my publisher. The last man calling in, I didn't fully follow the, uh, I, th- I, f- I think I did, but I'm not sure I fully followed it. But, but I get this a lot. I believe in God. Don't bother me with religion. Okay. If, if you are truthful, if you are faithful to the God of the Ten Commandments, the God of the, of, of what we call Judeo-Christian values, uh, and you believe that God judges people based on their behavior uh, in this world, and uh, as Franklin believed, and so on. I, uh, th- that's fine. I I have other arguments for organized religion, but uh, I'm not going to. Uh, th- it's not my specific subject now. My specific subject of this Ultimate Issues Hour, third hour every Tuesday is the Ultimate Issues Hour, is my column today that a lot of secular conservatives don't understand the need for religion in America, for God in America, the Bible in America, uh, any longer. They think America and the West could survive godless, and it's it's just not true. That's my argument. Secular conservatives make a big mistake, as wonderful as many of them are. Oh, Kadoki, 
let's go on here. See what you folks have to say. And all right, always trying to take people who differ. Buena Park, California. Cody, thank you for calling. Uh, thank you for hearing me. Um, I did have an answer for your question as to whether the United States could survive without religion. I believe it will. Um, it may not be the same conservative aspect that we see now, but I believe it will survive. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I remember my question was, will it survive? I was asking conservatives in my column, will it survive as the America that you love? So if you, Cody, say it will survive, but not as the conservative country, the conservative values being dominant in it that they have been, I agree with you, too. The, I don't think the United States will self-destruct as an entity. I think it'll self-destruct as a distinctive nation. Well, I think that's eventual, eventually in the future anyway. Um, as society okay. progresses, okay. as we become more knowledgeable, um, I think part of the reason that people are having trouble, trouble with religion now is society or science has come to the point where nothing's miraculous anymore. And as long as God is not doing anything, why should anybody pay attention? Well, uh the the notion that science will replace religion is one of the scariest notions that I can entertain since science has no values. Science doesn't tell me to take care of the poor. Science doesn't tell me not to rape. Science doesn't tell me not to murder. Science tells me nothing. Science is a moral idiot. So the thought that science will replace religion is, for me, a nightmare. Any, think, uh, any thoughts on that, Cody? It, but I think it is satisfying the argument of why there isn't. Um, oh, I agree. I, I, I agree with you. Is, People believe that, yes, yeah. I agree with you. So I think it's a catastrophe. Uh, because you believe. You no, not that? because I believe, but because because I care about goodness. Because I because I know that we're doomed if science replaces religion. That's all for the reasons I just explained. Science doesn't tell me a damn thing about how to lead my life. If if I were to be governed by science, then I would be governed by survival of the fittest. In which case, if I am stronger, I will kill you. That's the that's the law of nature. It's a very I should write an essay on that. Will science replace religion? Sci how about this? Maybe I should have a bumper sticker. Science is a moral idiot. I like that one. <laughs> and I will always thank you, Cody, for for forcing me to come up with it. It's true. It's really true. Uh anyway, I I do say though, I this is why I have such passion about people reading this book, because I will explain to you the values that you don't get from science and that you only get from this book, the Bible. And they're, they're very persuasive. If you care about goodness, remember, uh, maybe I haven't said this often. I don't even know if I've ever said it. My first passion is the issue of good and evil. I admit it. I admit it. God is not my first passion. My first passion is that people not have evil inflicted on them. I hope it's not heretical. I don't think it is because Proverbs says those of you who love God must hate evil. We'll be back. I'm Dennis Prager. Well, everybody, the final segment of the Ultimate Issues Hour today, Dennis Prager in Washington, D.C., and I am actually broadcasting from the home of the publisher of the book, Regnery. Everyone, and I mean, I mean literally everyone who has commented on this book thus far has commented on how simply physically stunning it is. I, I want to salute them again. It, it it's uh, everything came together and it is it's beautiful it's just beautiful 
By the way, it's sold out at uh, at um, Amazon, so it, obviously I mean, it's going to take a little while for you to get it. Please keep ordering it, obviously, but I just wanted you to know. And uh, they've they've printed a lot more. The book is the book is. Uh, I, I'll tell you this: not only selling well. See, a lot of books sell well, but nobody reads them. I think that's true for Hillary Clinton's memoirs, for example. But I think people will read this. That's what gives me. That's what gives me great uh, comfort. We got a battle to wage. And the, the 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 battle is what's coalesced symbolically into the which will be the number one seller in America, a book about gay bunnies, or a commentary on the biblical book of Exodus. Isn't that amazing that it's come down to that? I uh, it's you got to laugh. Life is really something. Ah, there's so many, uh, so many good calls and so little time. Let's see here. Oh yes, Richard in Ventura, California, is just rebaptized. Notice, without structure of religion, his life was re- deteriorating. Structure is very important. I'll do an ultimate issues hour on religion versus spirituality. I have, but I didn't do it for years. Uh, let's see. Who is the one who? Oh, this I would love to have taken this manual. I feel bad. Call me on. Um, Call me tomorrow, even. Maybe we take it. We can't survive. He's distorted by conservatives due to pressure from the left. I, I, the only reason I'm not taking it now is because I know I won't, you won't have enough time. See, the music's on. I, I think the opposite. I think Christianity and Judaism have been distorted by the left. So that would have been good. Bob and Jim and Isaac and Chris. All right, everybody. It is a joy to be with you. I fly back home to La La Land. And I won't see an airplane for about five days. Just breaks my heart. All right. Thank you for being with me. The name of the book is The Rational Bible. It's it's healthy stuff. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow.